Yes. Hey, Sydney. Can you move over oh, just like one? a foot? I want to thank all of you for coming today. I really appreciate uh, your support here today. And normally we do a little bit of an introduction, but in today's case, because we have four guests, uh, I want to let them introduce themselves. I don't want to take them away, uh, take away any of their time or uh, step on anything they would say. So without further ado, we're going to get the local engineer panel moving. And to start off, uh, and like I said, you guys can just kind of run through these questions in a natural sense. Uh, but starting off, they're going to tell you a little bit about who they are, uh, where they work currently, maybe even some of their job history, if you have any sense of job, uh, job history. And then you could give us a brief description of your job, uh, kind of what does a typical work week look like in your particular discipline. All right. And this week, we can just start off here with the introduction. Sure. Hi, guys. My name's Patrick. Uh, Patrick McLahan. I'm a civil engineer generally, uh, though I studied environmental engineering as well. I'm the only one here uh, who's not a Maribel graduate, um, though I've, I've worked with at least two of these gentlemen uh, quite a bit in AET and professional practice. Um, typical work week for me uh, is, is a hard thing to bundle up. Um, there will be work is about the only thing typical these days. Uh, it can range pretty widely from field work, uh, mapping streams, uh, geomorphic assessments to uh, being in the office and doing a lot of modeling work, uh, to mentoring uh, young engineers who are, who are coming up and, and learning new things. Um, but I generally enjoy the heck out of what I do. I, I meet a lot of different people. Um, I get to work on interesting problems. And uh, I don't know. Glad I ended up here. I wanted to be a forester. My dad said, go get an engineering degree, and I bet you can work in forestry if you want to. <laughs> that, that was good advice. Um, for, for taking away. Uh, my name is David Markham. Um, I'm, uh, I went here from 83 to 87, so that's a ways back. It was quite a different campus then. Uh, from here in Maribel, or any of y'all are also Maribel people. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, my grandfather lived about four blocks that way. I lived next to John Spears School, so this is the only place I applied when I was in high school. Um, I actually was not interested in engineering when I was here. I was a business management major. And after I got out, I got a job as a federal investigator doing work in Oak Ridge. And I did that until they actually closed our agency. Uh, it was a government thing. So then I kind of had to figure out what I really wanted to do. So I went back, I started at Mississippi, and then went to UT and got an engineering degree. Uh, it was initially kind of in site development type work, but uh, various pathways through different companies, I kind of specialized in uh, wastewater and water design and rehabilitation and things like that. Um, when I first decided I wanted to go back to school, we were living in Alcoa, and what kind of nudged me that way is because I was interested in the infrastructure and Springbrook Park and things like that. So eventually, just a year and a half ago, I finally got to work at the city of Alcoa. I'm the senior civil engineer in water and sewer, and so I'm back where I was kind of inspired to be for what started me down that engineering path. Uh, generally, we review plans for uh, new uh, construction. We uh, just maintain the existing system uh, and uh, work a lot with the other departments like streets and uh, development, things like that. My name is Tate Guerin. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. I work for a company called Construction Engineering Consultants. Um, and we primarily do uh, forensic engineering work. Um, I graduated from Maryland College in 2008 um, and uh, then went on to UT uh, to do my other undergraduate degree there uh, with a 3-2 program and then uh, got my master's at UT as well in environmental engineering. That's where I had some classes with, with Patrick. Um, but typically, uh, <laughs> My job description is kind of hard. I mean, forensic engineering, like Patrick says, and civil engineering is very broad. There's lots of different parts that go with that. But primarily what uh, what we do, we work with insurance companies and attorneys. Um, whenever something 
breaks, goes wrong, somebody gets hurt, um, and it's related to construction, roadway design, um, and in a lot of cases, work zone design for, for us. Um, when you're driving down the road and you got cones and things like that, um, there's somebody who has typically designed that or it's um, supposed to be done in a certain way. And so um, I, I do anything from uh, evaluating slip and falls, trip and falls, um, and looking at those from a perspective of does this meet the building code or um, maybe a handicap accessibility code. Uh, but I also deal with drainage issues um, and just general construction of houses, buildings. Um, if, if there's uh, construction that goes on and that construction doesn't meet the plans or doesn't meet the building code, um, you know, sometimes lawyers and insurance companies get involved and um, it, it, you have to go through that legal process to get, get things fixed um, and repaired. So we, we look at a number of those, but my job description is, is very uh, varied, I guess. Um, so, but a typical work week for me, I could go out, um, I could look at, uh, look at a, inspect a house or a roof, or I could also go out and look at a roadway um, where an accident might have occurred um, and, and evaluate the design of the road, um, evaluate the signage, um, things like that. Or I could be in my office looking at photographs, um, or I could be um, uh, having a deposition taken where a lawyer's asking me questions and I, I'm you know, answering his questions. And, and, uh, or I could be in a trial somewhere in front of a judge uh, and, and getting asked questions by a lawyer there. Um, so there's lots of different things that go along with it, but I'd be happy to answer some more of y'all's questions about it. Good? Yep. All right. uh, my name is Nathan Neff. Uh, Tate and I actually were in the same class from 04 to 08. Um, came here not wanting to be an engineer. I was actually going to be a math teacher. And uh, when I was playing baseball, our catcher convinced me that I didn't need to be a math teacher. And he said, you like math and physics? So I said, all right, I'll do that. So I ended up switching over and becoming a mechanical engineer. Um, after that, I did a tour for a couple years at XD where we did automotive stuff. Did not like that at all. But now I'm at uh, Noel Brands. Uh, we make all the Sharpies in the world. So anything you walk down, Walmart, Target, pens, highlighters, expo markers, anything like that. That's all made over there in William One Drive. Um, I'm also have another career. I am a, I'm also in the military, so I'm a captain in the Air Force. Um, my SOS or my OS, or my AFSC is cybersecurity, but over here at McGee Tyson, we do cybersecurity, intel, and um, they have the refueling wing over there as well. So at no we've been able to help someone, and, and in some cases they even result in changes of, of in, in the laws or insurance policies so that in the future, um, you know, those things are, are corrected before they even get to, get to the point that they did. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I, I draw the most satisfaction in, in my line of work. So um, early on in my engineering career, I was doing a lot of design work with uh, building assembly equipment. So that was pretty cool, you know, actually picking up something and designing it on CAD and seeing all the metal come together, all the issues, the root cause, the troubleshooting. That stuff was fun. Now that I've kind of moved into more of a management role, it's more of growing my team. It's the, right now it's hard to find tool makers. Toolmaker is basically a tool and die person. They can basically make anything out of metal. They can repair molds. They can build molds. They can design molds. Those right now are very, very hard to find. So I basically had to completely revamp the shop. And I've developed, I started with mold trainees, so where it's like a three year program. I'm trying to develop them to go to an apprentice program. From an apprentice program, trying to get them to the toolmaker. So trying to build my team, trying to basically just build that talent. Because it's, it's very hard to find that's not out there. On the military side, it's more of the, the helping. It's part of our mission over there. We have a um, GISP, which is basically a joint inter interoperability uh, communications platform, basically emergency communication. So 
it kind of came from the combat comm mission, which was from another unit that kind of dissolved and came to 119. But from there, oh, sorry. From there, we kept it actually in our unit. So we kind of used that as more domestic operations type of thing. So like hurricane relief, the wildfires up in Spooky Mountain, we were up there. I had, we had like seven guys from our unit up there helping out with the fires, just setting up emergency communication for the firefighters, police department, that type of stuff. That really, yeah, you're, you're sitting in a room normally on drill weekends and watching one of the heroes or what's going on, blah, blah, blah. But actually getting out there and helping from a disaster standpoint or training to be ready for a disaster to happen, those are, that's pretty cool. The military side. Thank you. If anyone has questions at the moment as far as like what they do or what their jobs look like, So uh, I know in our work, we have place people that can come actually out there and um, work on the plant floor. I know there has been some internships, like especially last year, our HR manager, her son, has been in an engineering program, and he actually worked the summer with us. So that's definitely an option. We do from time to time. Uh, just kind of depends on our on our workload. Um, you know, every now and again we have people send in a resume and, and uh, you know, if, if we need someone, a lot of times over the summer we, we might do that. Okay. The city of Alcoa, they have done that in the past, and since I've been there, there has been talk of doing it again, but it's not currently in place, but uh, we've had a lot of some older staff turnover lately, so it's possible we can get stuff like that. <coughs> We love interns. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't mention, I work for civil and environmental consultants in Knoxville, um, and I run the water resources uh, branch of the Knoxville office. Um, we do uh, civil site design, uh, ecological engineering, um, environmental science, and structural engineering out of that office. Um, big and, company. Yeah, it, it's a big company. Uh, and as an intern, You'd get exposed. You'd probably be seated in one of those groups, but have exposure to just about you know, any one of those groups, uh, depending on your interest. So, you looking for a summer internship? Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'll give, give you my card before we go. Okay, I would appreciate that. Yeah, and that's that's one thing. I mean, like Patrick's, a, he, he works for a big company. I mean, and David's obviously with a municipality, and my, mine is very small. It's, it's made up of about four or five guys, so, and then, I'm yeah. sure yours is, is it's a big or five other companies, so, so yeah. a lot of employees, but yeah, you definitely are interested in that. Yeah, yeah that goes for everybody. Yeah. Maybe something quickly that would be of interest, uh, I know, uh, from what you said, uh, David and David might have interesting takes on this, working for private sector versus the government or working for a city, do you have any perspective on that? <laughs> um, yeah. PC take? Um, years ago, I worked for the federal government. That was my first job uh, pretty much after I left here. I worked here for a little bit upstairs in an office that would rent space but, uh, with the government. When I left, uh, there was a perception that uh, government people didn't work hard, so they didn't hard to find a job, which is probably why I went back to school to be an engineer. Um, after that, I worked for a number of years for different consulting engineering companies. And um, there's a, an idea there where uh, you design the work, there's a creativity to it, but you're also looking for your next job. Uh, it's just, uh, and maybe you can address this part too, what you're working on now, you should also be finding your clients and your jobs for a year or two in advance. So when you finish this, you won't just pull out the end and have nothing to do. You'll have more work to roll into. Uh, it was strange when I went to the city of Alcoa on the municipal private side, because all of a sudden uh, it's much busier, it's much more varied, but also I didn't have to fill in a timesheet every day accounting for all the billable hours that, uh, you know, because you're 
every every fifteen minutes or whatever it's billable, you know, to because they so they can turn that around and make a profit. So it's uh, uh, personally, I was always wanting to get to the municipal side, even through all those years of working as consultants. So I'm, I'm enjoying that side much better. So the old adage of "hurry up and wait" that you probably heard from the military, it's in the government. Yes, it's it's one of my frustrating parts. Um, just seems like to get something done, it takes a lot of signatures, a lot of yes, yes sir, yes ma'am, type of, a lot of red tape to get done. On the private sector, it, it doesn't, I mean, it can move just like you said, it's quick, it's fast paced, it's, there's a lot more things to fill your time up, is kind of where I'm at. But there's also a lot of correlation between the military and the private sector, a lot of, you know, the whole chain of command type of stuff, it's moving to the private sector a lot of the processes to improve different systems are based off of systems that were taken from the military. So there's a lot of similarities, but in the grand scheme of it, it's a lot slower to get something done as opposed to being private sector. Would you agree? Well, uh, <coughs> at least in my, in my sense. I can see that, yeah. Now that I'm on that government side, it seems very busy and it moves fast, but uh, I know somebody submits something to us for approval and before you know it, a week has gone by and they're probably sitting there waiting, <laughs> you know, not realizing we have a bunch of those to get through and uh, they can't move forward until we put our stamp on it of approval. And more of mine speaking from more of the military. Yeah, so, so, but yeah, so I can see how like to get orders cut to go to do something. It's so many signatures to say yes, 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 yes. Like, so like domestic operations to get our unit to be tasked to go actually help out. Sometimes that paperwork has to be started almost a week beforehand before they can say, yes, I released these funds for these people to go, right? And by then, sometimes it's too late. It's like, well, we should have been in there as that hurricane was leaving. Instead, we're two or three days what are out. It's like, well, what, what help are we giving the, the people of the area? So, and that's what a lot of the exercises in the last two or three years and the people that have been put into place have been trying to shrink that and remove some of those red tape. Uh, I'll uh, mention, well, I think no matter, and you guys can speak to this, no matter what side you're on, if you're in uh, private practice or, or uh, public work, so government or private, um, the two work together uh, quite a bit. I mean, you're gonna have to permit anything you're getting done, and that's um, a lot of what a lot of what I do in, in sort of shepherding that connection between government agencies and uh, private folks trying to do things with their land is managing expectations because you know that that person owns that land time is money you know they've got a loan they need to be paying back making money on their development and we got to get these permits through on the other end and that's that's a government process that sometimes requires lots of checklists and lots of approvals uh, and so you know the, the two work together um, it's kind of hard to, to separate the move on uh, away from what they do daily and kind of uh, this is their chance to give advice to their old selves, give advice to you guys uh, as far as in the engineering programs, in school in general, uh, things that I think would be great to touch on are going to be like big surprises when you actually started your engineering coursework. Uh, things like what led you to pursue one discipline over another, why civil versus nuclear, why civil versus uh, whatever. And then from there, maybe we can even mention a few interdisciplinary skill sets. So you mentioned, you know, a lot of, uh, Tate in particular, communication is probably extremely important in his position. Uh, knowing the language, knowing all of the uh, special circumstances that need to be there. So maybe coursework in like law would have been helpful for him for his particular career path. So I just kind of wanted you guys to speak to that as well as you work your way through. But uh, maybe we can start with that. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, when I decided to go back to school, I didn't quite know what I was getting into other than uh, I knew what I was interested in certain aspects of engineering. So um, as I went through the different classes, they, it was all cumulative and it built on itself. But when I finally got my first job, I guess the first biggest surprise was that uh, I wasn't actually expected to know everything. Um, when I 
got my first job, they had me studying some local regulations and things for a week or two, and then they called me in and gave me something to design, uh, a little cul-de-sac street, and I went cold all over, like I'd forgotten everything I had ever learned. I've heard other people had this experience. Uh, I went back to the office and just, uh, now where do I start? But uh, then I kind of remembered something that they had told me at UT in engineering, which was uh, what one professor described as the engineering method, where uh, you just, uh, if one part, you, you finish what you can do for now on that part, you keep working, you find something else, you keep eating into it from different directions, basically. So that engineering method was something I kind of learned that was useful. Um, uh, another thing uh, was that, uh, I tend to be introverted, as I guess a lot of engineers are. So it's very easy when you have the job to find out something or get an assignment or whatever and then rush back to your, your safe office and hide there. So it's uh, good to get up and go out and talk to people and interact and make connections and always listen and always absorb and like a sponge trying to hear what's going on because you never know when something you've heard will be important to another conversation that you can uh, toss in your back and add to that. surprise. I mean, for me, uh, while I was in school uh, here at Maryville College, I, I was actually working part-time at a golf course down the road, and uh, I, that's where I met my, my boss now, one of my bosses um, at that time, and I was you know, talking to him, and I said, yeah, I'm doing this engineering thing. I'm going to be at UT, and he was a professor at UT at the time in the civil engineering department. So it worked out pretty good for me. Um, but so I started working also with them part-time um, right around the end of my time at Maryville College. And so, at, you know, I started getting introduced to this, this concept of forensic engineering. And, and then I started taking courses at UT, and I was still working there. Um, and it was, it was kind of interesting because... We do we do engineering work, but it's it's a little different. It's kind of almost backwards from what these guys do. Um, you know, everything's already happened. All the designs taking place and the construction's going on, and so we we kind of look at it from okay, we got this problem, and then kind of work backwards to all the way back to the design and see what what went wrong. And um, so I mean, it for me. The big surprise was, okay, you, you're, you're going to school in civil engineering, and let's be honest, I, I, don't, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. I mean, once you start going to do civil engineering, you know, you got, you got the soil side of it, you got the transportation side of it, you got the water part of it, and uh, what am I missing here? Structure. The, the structure side, um, and, you know, you're like, okay, well, I'll do one of these, and for me, I, I ended up doing water, and and uh, part of that is because I I got a basically scholarship to do my my master's in water, so that's what I was going to do in uh, water and environmental engineering. So I did that, and now I don't really use it as much. Um, I, I do have drainage cases um, from time to time, but you know that's that was one of the big surprises was. You know, civil engineering is a very, very broad um, you know, discipline. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, um, but they all work together, like Patrick was saying, with the municipalities. I mean, the, the, the different parts of civil engineering work together. Um, and, you know, you really, when you start out, you take classes in all of those things. And so the, 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 the big surprise for me is how how I've had to use that stuff over over time and um, at least, if nothing else, be familiar with it um, because it's going to come into play at some point in time throughout your career where you have to, you have to utilize all those things. And, and the, the big surprise, that I guess the biggest surprise is when you go from Maryville College to the University of Tennessee or another... Big, big school like that. Um, you 
know, if you're taking the big classes, they don't care very much about what you're doing in those classes. You know, it's not like Dr. C offices where you, you know, head down to her office and she's always in there and she's always willing to help. You know, it's a, it's a different animal. And even when we got into engineering classes, they were much smaller, but still it was, there was still a lot of people in them. Um, and, and, you know, that was a big surprise for me. Um, you know, I, at the time I was very soft-spoken and, you know, didn't, didn't want to, you know, put myself out there. Um, but that, that was one of the big surprises, especially moving from a small school like Maryland College to UT. You stole mine. Did I? That was it. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> no, but um, kind of like what Daryl said, I started out mechanical engineering because I didn't know what I wanted to do in engineering. But I kept, I, I remember looking online saying what all a mechanical engineering could do. It said jet engine, uh, manufacturing, repair refrigerators, AC. I was like, oh, basically everything, right? Well, I'm going to figure it out. And I can figure it out whenever I want when I get there, right? So one of my big, other big surprises was um, I thought when you're going through engineering school, all those thermodynamic, dynamic classes, compressible flow, all of them, the numerical analysis, derivative equations, all that stuff. I thought you had to remember it all. I mean, you had to be an expert. I had to remember every single one of these things that I'm going to be an engineer because someone's always going to come up to me asking me about, what do you think about this? Is this making sense to me? So I kind of like put a lot of pressure on myself that I had to remember all this stuff. Uh, by the end, you start getting so focused, especially whenever you find a job, they start training you or you need to start focusing on what you're actually working on at that moment. It's not have to remember everything from semester, the second of my junior semester in thermodynamics. So I was like kind of getting, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, I'm not the smartest person that went through here. <laughs> it took a lot of hard work for me. I was base, a big team oriented person, so it's all about networking and talking to people. So that's one of the biggest things I can stress to you guys, get out there, talk to people, make connections with just like Kate was saying, you never know who you're going to meet long down the line where they're going to help you along in your career. And that helped me a lot in the military, especially even if you want to get into the guard in, while you're in college, the connections you can make there. I have people that work at the FBI over there. I got people that work at ORNL, Y12, that are hiring managers, people that have you know a lot of say in who comes in their doors. So basically what I'm saying is network and get out there and talk to people because that is very important. The second thing was I didn't realize I came from Pennsylvania down here from a small town. And when I got here, Maryville College fit right into my personality, small town, small university. Dr. Skiopsi was great at helping me. Then I go to UT, it's like, whoa, this is different. There's 200 people in this like, statics class. There's 30 people that are should be working at ORNL right now, designing something to go to outer space. <laughs> I remember coming back to Dr. Shelton's class for a numerical analysis because I had no idea what the professor was even writing on the board. <laughs> thank goodness. Thank you. Appreciate it took it. me a minute to even understand you what that professor too. was trying to do. Yes. Yeah. I do remember that. So that's what I'm saying. Connections. And just don't feel like you have to know everything because you don't. And even making connections in this room, um, you know, I, he and I were in different engineering fields, but, you know, I saw him a lot in the computer lab, and I mean, just having that familiar face and, and a friend, um, you know, that you'd made a connection with before, and there were, there were how many, two or three other guys? Mm -hmm. A few other guys that, that uh, were kind of doing the same thing, and, you know, it's nice, it's nice to do that together, because you're, you're all kind of going through the same, the same process, so, you know, it's not, it's networking even starting now and, and you know, making those connections in, in here. Yeah, I can only just echo what those guys are saying. Is, you know, tend to your community, like, you know, reach out to one another, help one another, uh, stay in touch with each other. Um, what you're going through right now is unique. Nobody else is going to be going through it. It's going to be different the next year. So, you know, build your community and maintain it. And as far as surprises, my biggest surprise came after I got out and started practicing. Um, 
you know, I was sort of, all right, I'm going to get this degree, and I've got this degree, and I'm an engineer, I'm a civil engineer, which means, by golly, people are going to listen to what I have to say, and, and I, you know, I put my seal on it, they're going to know it's good. And it took me a long time to realize it takes years to build credibility. Um, and, you know, just, just know that coming out, come out with a bit of humility. Um, in school, I feel like my experience was that the most valuable thing is I learned how to learn. How to, how to take a problem that was unfamiliar, look at it from a few different sides, and, and work through it uh, when it's sometimes uncomfortable. So, yeah. yeah, and there's people out there that have, have done it before you, and they know a whole lot more than you, and you, you know, you can learn so much from, from just watching what people do and paying attention. You know, it, it's, there's, there's so much more to learn, and you, you don't even scratch the surface of it when you are in school. It's not even close. I mean, <laughs> when, when are you done? <coughs> I, you're not. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I pull stuff out all the time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, learning and relearning stuff. And the other thing is, is that, you know, part of our, our as an engineer, um, part of your licensure is that you, you have to do continuing education. I mean, you, you have to spend, what is it? Twenty something hours, twenty six oh, yeah. hours. Yeah, it's like twelve hours a year. Um, just, just you know, keeping up with your education. So, um, but yeah, you can you can learn so much from from the people that have been there already, and, and don't hesitate to, to ask and you know put yourself out there so that you can. <coughs> Does anyone have questions for them related to pooling? For those of you all who um, who did transition from Arable to UT, and so you, like, there's this big shock of going from small town to University of Tennessee. Um, what did you do to be able to uh, make that adjustment and then <coughs> be successful at UT after you're successful here? I'm replaying it. <coughs> well, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally from South Knoxville. I, I still live in South Knoxville. Um, and so when I, I came to Maryville, um, you know, I, I was looking for a small small school. Uh, at the same time, I was actually planning on playing baseball. I didn't end up doing that because I realized I was going to do engineering. It was kind of like, well, I'm not going to play baseball. You played baseball. Um, so he was doing that at the same time. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing, and my wife was at UT. She's a year older than I am. So she was actually at UT um, <coughs> at the same time I was at Maryville College. So, I mean, I, I, had, I knew what was going on at UT because she was taking those courses. And, you know, she has these classrooms. They're, they're more like auditoriums. I mean, taking, taking your, your classes in there, and I'm, I'm doing classes and size like this or smaller um, for, for everybody. Um, but it, you know, it's hard to, to prepare yourself for that um, transition. But you just have to, you, you've got to be responsible for your own self. And, and one of the things that is, you know, you, you have to be prepared. You, you don't need to procrastinate. And you have to ask for help if you need it. And that, that's whether you're here or at UT. I mean, you know, is the access easier here? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we would be working in the computer lab together on something. And if we couldn't figure something out, we would literally go as a group to talk to Dr. Cialsis, and then she'd take us and we'd go work on something on a board somewhere. I mean, but, you know, if you still have to take that responsibility to go... Um, you know, talk to your professor, even though you may have to walk six miles at UT to go find where their office is. You know, that was ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous. It's like you don't know where anything is. Um, I remember going to see one of my professors. I couldn't figure out where his room was, but his office was probably about half of this. And it was stacked with papers and books. It was like a a rat's nest. You had to walk <laughs> between it all, sidestep, and then his desk was piled up behind all these books and stuff. And I was like, goodness gracious, why is it so hard to find this guy? But 
finally did. I yeah, they semester. They've got him stuck <coughs> in the closet somewhere. I mean, like, it's literally a scene from a movie. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just more of, I'm glad I went to Maryville first because it got all of the, the stuff that you learn your freshman and sophomore years out of the way of you know, time management, your discipline, and just being on your own for the, really for the first time, right? Where you're making most of your own decisions at that point. So then when you go to UT, you got all that stuff. You got your you got your uh, study habits already locked down, things like that. So now it's just adjusting it to a, a bigger scale that I could just roll out of Carnegie and walk to class in like two minutes. I'm good. There, it's like, all right, how am I going to get there? Where am I going to park? Or am I going to ride my bike and chai it, uh, chain it to this uh, um, to the stadium? Or is my buddy going to come out, take the seat off my bike? This thing. Stuff like that's that. Not, that's no joke. Yeah, my roommate took my seat off my bike, and I had to ride home without my seat. Even, I mean, <laughs> even if you have a par- <laughs> even if you have a parking permit, there's no guarantee that you're going to get to park anywhere. I, I've parked. Or where you're where you're to- car to get towed. Yeah, or that. Yeah, it's, it's just different it. dynamics at that point. It's all the same thing. It's just on a bigger scale. I'm just glad I was here first, right, to get those everything locked down and then take it to a bigger scale. Because, like he said, professors there, you have to ask for help. They don't, it's not like the office of the but just the professors over there. But. but, you know, I think one of the things that that I, I, I wish I had done a little bit more of, even here and, and at UT, um, and I did a little bit of that, but, and it's, it's part of that networking is you go, um, you know, if you, if you do your work and you get those study habits, you also need to go have some fun and enjoy yourself, and and that's part of that networking is is doing some of those things and um, you know getting to know some people. Um, you know, I I wish I'd done a little bit more of that in both places. So you still got to enjoy yourself. I mean, you're only in college once, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, you might change. Time wasn't like the first. You might change your mind. I mean. It's, Go ahead. David, I wanted to ask you about that just because that's a very unique way to do things. You had a full career in business management and probably when you went back to school, family, a, a full life. I think there's a few people in here that are maybe looking at getting you know, just their BS, working for a bit, and then going back to school later on. What type of challenges should they expect when you're part of the workforce going back to school? Um, well, probably the biggest thing would be scheduling, just because uh, if you got to be, uh, if you have responsibilities at that point, and you have family and you have a job, you have to find a way to make time for the classes and, and work around and get back. When I went back, um, I went part time, so it took longer than it might have just to just dive in and get it done in two or three years. Um, I had to start with some math classes I didn't have, and you can only take those sequentially. Obviously, and you can't take the engineering classes till you have math classes. So the first few years, and it took several years, I was just taking one class per semester, and it really seemed like it was going to take forever. Um, so, so that's kind of the biggest thing is just uh, you got to be prepared. Uh, you're you're a different person when you go back. Uh, you're uh, I, when I went back, there were some other people who had uh, been out in the world and kind of came back. And we all seemed to appreciate more why we were there. We were always the ones sitting on the front row. Mm-hmm. And um, you're nodding like you've seen this. So. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I was, I was going to ask you that, if you felt like you appreciated it way more than the, than the younger people. Yeah. Oh, we, very much. And um, I think it was easier for them in some ways because they were in a student mentality. Yeah. And had been doing that. And also by going back part-time the way I did, by the time I got to the end, some tests and things that you have to take that you have to remember uh, stuff that you did when you got there quite a few years before than what the the other students there uh, or the time that they have to remember it so um, it was it was worth it but at the time it was kind of frustrating because it seemed like it was going to take forever but luckily I had a lot of core classes from here that transferred over and so and uh, I had some good professors at UT who managed to finagle things, so some stuff here counted as engineering electives. Because I didn't take any engineering when I was here, obviously. So all of a sudden, I kind of looked up one day, and it's like, hey, I can graduate. And it almost snuck up on me by the time I'd been going to school for so long. Thank you. 
Does anyone have questions for them? I have two. Um, one is kind of a curiosity question, and I'm interested in how it's kind of a personal research question. And this, the second um, I'm going to ask for, uh, the other one I'm going to ask now. So, you, Nathan, you mentioned this idea that you're going to have to remember everything. You thought you were going to have to remember everything. I, I want everybody to filter that with whatever we teach you is very important and you should learn it. <laughs> but at the same time, I agree with you, right? And so knowing what you know now about that and about what the purpose was of what you were doing here in differential equations or calc three or whatever you took, um, what <laughs> my bringing back terrible memory. <laughs> so, uh, yes. uh, but, <laughs> uh, also, I'm going to pay you later about the nice shout outs. So I'll pay you later for that. But um, what what can you tell students now who are in this situation and how they should how they might approach these courses and the learning of this material. Like, in other words, you know you're going to forget it, right? And nobody expects you to remember it. So what is the purpose? What, what is the purpose and how would you approach it now knowing that? So a lot of it to me boils down to the process of getting you to a solution, right? You're, you're making your problem statement. You're looking at the, the, the problems that at, at hand, right? So you've got all these different ways you can approach a problem. But it's really the methodical approach to problem solving, right? And then also just kind of getting a foundation to engineering. So you got your physics, you got your thermodynamics, you got a basic understanding of all the principles, right? So yes, you may not remember every formula that goes to it, but when you're faced with an issue with an injection mold and it's not working, then you can kind of go back and look at, you know, about how the thermal expansion is happening in the mold, or this and that. And then you kind of go back to some of these courses that you had and go, well, that, that definitely makes sense, so I can rule this problem out, and I can move on to another situation, right? So kind of, for me, it's more of a base, and then from there, I can kind of go, I remember there was a formula for this, or I remember we talked about something with this in thermodynamics, and I'll go research that profession, so it's a more of a, the base for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope... See, I just didn't have any quizzes on any math stuff because I, I'd be in big trouble. Um, you know, and I, I wish I might have approached it more like David did, you know, where he appreciated it more. I mean, to me, it was like, like I had to get to this point, like, you know, and you had so much going on, and I, I was an idiot, and I took like 18 hours at a time. I mean, it was crazy, like. You know, that was part of my problem. I was taking too much, you know, just had too much on my plate. But, you know, it, it is it is a base kind of thing, like Nathan said. I mean, where, you, you know, you're going to need the basics of all of this stuff. And you may need some part of it more more than others. I mean, um, you know, if I, if I was doing a lot more probably structural design and things like that, I mean, I, my math would probably... I would probably use more of it, um, but you know, the, you still have to have it as you move forward to understand different things. I mean, Patrick and I took a lot of water classes, and there's a lot of crazy formulas and derivations of stuff. I mean, that I I don't remember those either. I mean, but it, depending on it, he probably uses a lot of those a lot more than I do, um, and you know, a lot of those you're, they're going to get put into a, computer program, but you still have to, I mean, especially if, if one of us is going to put our stamp on something, I mean, you still have to understand what it's doing and what that program's doing and what, what you know, how you got to that point. So it, it's uh, also when you're designing like a piece of equipment, I mean, you got to be, you got to be aware of the forces that are going to be acting on whether you're building a robot or a sewing machine, you have to understand the forces that are acting on this piece of equipment. How's this going to respond when you do this, right? And that all boils down to the math and the physics that you have, that you went through or you're going through right now. Yeah, and the same thing, I mean, you know, if we're looking at some sort of a building collapse or a bridge collapse or something like that, I mean, you know, all those things come into play, I mean, at some point in time, <laughs> you 
some something's gone wrong somewhere down the line where there was some input, you know, in in the design process where you were putting something into equation or you know you might have missed something as far as rebar design or or maybe somebody just drilled a hole through a piece of rebar and that was that was all it took and it, it collapsed. I mean there's there's so many different things but I wish I had I had appreciated it more um, at the time rather than sometimes it was like oh I just gotta I gotta just pass this test or whatever you know and, and then I think sometimes when you do that instead of like hey I may I may really use this one day instead of really kind of appreciating it for what it what it is um, you know you just try to finish or get through or pass or whatever and it's hard to do I mean that's that's it's easy for me to say that now but it's it, a balance in there yeah it, it's all it's all a balance I mean it's it's hard to do that but but I, I would encourage you to you know as best you can in the situation you're in to appreciate it a little bit more <clears throat> there's a, a lot to learn to be a civil engineering student and a short amount of time to learn it and uh, they're really just trying to prepare you so you can go in any direction because you don't know what field want to go in maybe or which way the winds will carry you. Um, I, you know, I was, I was, I started not knowing much math at all because I hadn't needed it and I went all the way through differential equations and I was really proud of that. And then in my current job, about the only math I do is I uh, calculate slopes on pipes and tally up materials used in construction, like 20 pipes or 400 feet or whatever. So, but when you're at your point in your early career, you don't know what you're going to need. So uh, there's just so much time to cram in so much stuff. Um, we had one class, a structures class at UT, where um, we spent the whole semester basically evaluating one beam, kind of the, the bending moment of one beam. And on the last day, they took us to the computer lab and showed us the computer program that would do it like that. <clears throat> but they said you have to know uh, what you're doing to see if the computer program answers so it's just it's all it's just there to kind of give you a, a dual a bunch of doorways. So um, I, I, I again you just echo a lot of things that you guys are saying. Um, you, you don't have to be an expert in every one of these classes coming out. What will help you though is to know where to go look for answers uh, when you come out. Know know the language. STEM is a language. Uh, if you can speak the language, you're halfway there. You can ask the right questions uh, to get you where you need to be. Um, and in terms of Asking those questions and, and, and being familiar with, uh, like, talk about all, all the math, um, you know, you get into uh, calculus and differential equations, and real quick discover that wait a minute, you can't solve these directly. There's all these indirect solutions and methods, and they're all flawed. Um, you know what else is flawed? The models that they're built on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, there's an adage that holds real true in the work I do that uh, all models are wrong, some of them are useful. Um, so, really pays to, that's why you're here, is to you know, build your judgment and uh, know where to look, find the answers and, and learn the language. So I'm going to ask my research question. Um, it's not about math. <laughs> Just to relax, everybody. Um, I'm curious if you know what imposter syndrome is, and I think, David, you talked about it kind of indirectly a little bit a few, a few minutes ago and whether you experienced it, have felt it, feel it now, what did you do to deal with it? Um, I'll let you take that wherever you want to go. Give us a little more. Imposter syndrome is when, despite the fact that you may have done really well and gotten a degree or you, you have on paper what is required to do a job, you still feel like at some point somebody is going to expose you for an imposter, like you don't actually belong there. Um, you know, you, you've gotten what you've gotten without really deserving it, and at some point somebody's going to figure that out if you just feel like an imposter deep down inside. Yeah, that's really easy for me to feel that way. <laughs> um, you know, when you, you're you sitting on a, on a witness stand in front of a judge, and you got a lawyer who's about to grill you about something that you've known or done by a bazillion times, 
Um, you know, but you always have this like doubt, like, you know, oh gosh, I don't know. Am I really, do I know this or that? I mean, yeah, that happens a lot. But uh, I, mean, I deal with that a lot. Um, and it, it's, but that, that's why you, you, you practice and that's why you continue to educate yourself. I mean, um, I think all of us have probably felt that at some point in time. Um, you know, and, and like David said earlier, you, you go through your process, and and if you do that and you do it the right way, you know you know you've done it right, and you know what you're you're doing. So, it's, but it, I, especially as an engineer, I mean, it, it's always the licensure part of it um, and the requirements that go along with that. It's a lot of pressure, um, and and. Also, I don't know if you all are even aware of this now. I mean, we, we've got a code of ethics that we have to follow um, as a licensed engineer, and that plays a big part in that, too. So, um, you know, that's our, our, our number one is hold paramount the safety of the, the public. And so that's a, that's a big burden on your shoulders, um, probably more so for these guys who deal with the design part of it. Than it is for me. I mean, I did, we do a little bit of that, but um, but yeah, it's hard to feel adequate, you know, with, with any any part of your life. But yeah, you just there's so much to go on with almost everything, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I don't. I'd like to know what your all's thoughts are on that too. I'm just curious. Well, the uh, uh, between saving grace when it comes to dealing with buzzers and everything. It's, the knowledge that everyone else is doing it at some level too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. I'm glad to know that. That's so true. I've been in meetings where people just kind of somebody will say something, and the other people will say it. They'll repeat it, and then it kind of advances things. And then somebody else will say something, and, and everybody you can see is just trying to kind of find the, the common thing to so uh, they can all move ahead together because everybody's kind of uncertain. And um, you know, it, it's better to ask questions. And to Listen, than to bluff your way through because uh, it, you know, people will spot that sooner than if you if you don't know something. It's okay not to know it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know. Are, those are powerful words. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Be ashamed of there's, there's no shame in that whatsoever. No, I agree. We're a little over on time, everyone. So I want everybody to give a big round of applause to Patrick, Nathan, Tay, and David for giving all their time today. I don't know how are your schedules okay. Do you have time for a couple more questions, or do you need to go like a little bit? Hey, it's all good. Yeah, it's good. So you have their attention right now for a few more minutes. What questions do you have? Or You can even ask a question unrelated to you know the STEM side of it, or even if you're a non-engineering major. Um, I wonder like how does like the salary system would like to be for just engineering, or even <coughs> for, like for y'all like uh, certain jobs. I guess I guess it's probably better to maybe just leave that at comfortability in life, like. In the in the in this local area where you work, do you find it's a reasonably sustainable living, uh, exceedingly sustainable? Maybe that's a, a good way to approach that question. How how does how has your life been impacted financially since you moved? I would say it's probably one of my better choices. I mean, definitely going to pay better than a math teacher. <laughs> I mean, I, my wife is a counselor, so I I see the stuff that she deals with with schools. And, I'm glad I decided to go the engineering route. Um, I have three young kids. Uh, I'm not sh struggling, I guess is what I could say. I mean, I'm living comfortably and I'm, I'm good I mean, in the area. I think engineering is probably one of the better fields to, to be in, right? Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. I mean, I think Nathan and I are kind of in the same boat, especially being the same age. We got kids right around the same age. I mean, um, certainly comfortable and it's, you know, all I think all jobs are, are are different. I mean, but I think getting getting a degree and then 
a degree in engineering is certainly um, something good that you can do for yourself. I mean, there's there's lots of different places you can go and take that, um, but but certainly I think I would say that it's it's a comfortable life. And you know, I've I've got I've got siblings who don't have a college degree, you know, and their work schedule is a lot harder and different than mine. Um, and, and so is their pay. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, <clears throat> but I think any job that you do, um, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Um, and, and that's probably the biggest thing that I would say. Um, but certainly a good place to start is, is with a good degree, and I think engineering is certainly one of those. Yeah, what, what they said, um, back, back when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do to go back to school, I considered lots of different things like journalism or getting an MBA based on the business management degree I had or, or different things, uh, finding another government job. But, um, you know, part of this, it, I wanted to be what's considered a professional, uh, professional engineer, PE, that's the license you get. So it's, it's just good to be a professional. Yeah, you, you know, the sciences are, are a strong earner, uh, engineering is a strong earner. It, it will, it has, it has afforded me um, the ability to not necessarily worry about money. Um, most of the effort I put into that side is thinking about how, how can I use it? How can I leverage it, you know, for the future or to help, to help my kids or my nieces and nephews? Um, so, yeah, you, you can't complain at all about it. You're, you'll be better off than most. Um, so I know you have to have your basis, like your mathematics and your sciences, like in college. But do you feel like you learn more on the job than you did, like kind of in school? Or? It's it's different, um, and it's hard to say which one's more important. Your schooling is your your foundation. You're always going to be reaching back into that well um, that you developed during your your engineering uh, studies. But you're constantly learning new stuff on the job. Um, I guess the biggest difference is kind of doing it on your toes more uh, professionally because you know, sometimes there's no one to, to I, I hate to say this out loud, but sometimes there's no one to ask the question to. Um, that's why you want to build your community so that you have a broad net of folks you can ask questions to. But there are occasions where and it just comes down to you, grab, you know, grinding through something. Um, so yeah, it's a little more on your toes. They're, they're different. And it depends on what you what you choose to do. I mean, you know, if, if you are specifically looking for some, something really specific, um, like structural engineering or something, I mean, certainly your, your class, I mean, those are, you have to learn everything in that um, to be able to do that. But, you know, for somebody like me, I mean, mine's, mine's very broad, I mean, and there's a lot of aspects of it that I never learned in school. Um, and and that, you, that you're just not going to be able to. Um, so it, it's it depends on what you do, but certainly you you got to learn how to learn, and, and the best way to do that is in, in an environment like this. Yeah, um, I talked about or she mentioned imposter syndrome and all. Uh, that was a little common in my first engineering job where I get this task and this task and learn something new, but uh, all of it was one way or another familiar to something I had heard in school. Just enough that it sounded familiar that I knew where to go look it up or, or you know, follow through and kind of teach myself some of it, ask some people in better ways or shortcuts or workarounds. But yeah, you know, the, the school part is the perfect foundation for everything. The biggest difference is you're dealing with the psychology of people too. So you may be having a technical problem, but you've got this group of 10 to 15 different people that you're trying to work with. Solution and you get finger pointing, or you get people that don't want to do their, you know what I'm saying? It's the psychology of how do I get this person to get on board to, and to get to this goal together as a group, as a team, and not, you know, get the people on the bus that need to be on the bus and get the people off the bus that need to be off the bus to get to where you need to go. So you almost become a psychology major at the same time. <laughs> Any 
Any other questions? You guys have fun at your job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, kind of what we say in, in my line of work is you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it, you know, you never know what's what's going to what's gonna come in. I mean, so it, it's, a, it's a fun fun line of work. Sometimes you feel like you're living a sitcom. <laughs> Maybe this would, uh, as a, like a final send off, uh, a lot of these students are going to be looking for internships. So when it comes to getting those, let's go ahead and assume they've gotten an internship. In a mentor, what are the characteristics that they should be looking for? Like if there's multiple people in the organization office and trying to really pick someone to develop a dynamic relationship with, what should they be looking for in that mentor? Maybe like one or two traits from that you would look for in that mentor? That's a great question. Um, I'll jump in first. A big one for me, if someone gets excited to answer your questions, um, they're engaged, they're interested in you, uh, that, that's a good sign of those two things. So, um, you know, so if you truly feel like you're bothering somebody with questions, even if you're a hard or hard, you're like, I know it's a dumb question, but I need to ask it anyway. You know, the person that's excited to answer it, latch on to it. I mean, I work with my boss, who, like I told you, he was uh, he was a college professor, and you know, so it's easy to when you're talking to somebody like that for them to explain something to you. I mean, that's what they've done for years and years and years, and so you know that was that was a nice a nice thing for me because you know they have that ability to kind of teach you. Um, so if you can kind of recognize that in, in someone as a mentor, um, you know, you, you should latch on to that and, and you know, try and learn as much as you can. Yeah, it's, uh, it's what everybody's saying. You find the guy that wants to help you. I've had bosses who um, just, you, you knock on the door and, ah, what do you want? And I've had bosses who assign work and then they go ahead and do it themselves. So you, you're ready to start on it. It's all all done. You have nothing to do. So it's uh, finding those guys who just have that natural connection. And, and what to avoid is probably just as important. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a good point. Yeah. Hall monitors, um, you know, uh, box checkers. I don't know. You don't want those. But you know, and some someone, uh, another thing that has some common interest with you as well that doesn't that's not always even related to to work um, you know it's that's that's another thing like I said I, I met my boss at, at a golf course where I worked at I mean he, he likes playing golf he's working at a golf course I like playing golf we like sports so yeah, yeah it's, I mean it's just life is not always about work um, you know you gotta you gotta enjoy it while it's happening because it goes by fast yeah, I probably echo, echo what you say. There's somebody that's excited when you come talk to them about whatever it is. Because at the end of the day, that those types of people are the ones that are going to go the extra mile for you. They're going to be patient with you. They're going to teach you, and they're just those type of people. Mentors usually will draw you, will draw people to them. So, good teacher, and just excited that you're coming to talk to them. Would you look at them one more round? Yeah. And I want to say we're going to try to continue this conversation. Um, Patrick's trying to put together a social, yeah, what are we calling it? I don't know what to call it, but um, <laughs> this, this is it. Like, what would you guys be more interested in doing like on a semi-regular basis? Like meeting up at a restaurant with, with uh, young professionals um, and have a meal, have a cocktail, uh, meet up at a park somewhere, any, any feedback? What do you not want to do? 